We do just about everything online today. You can shop, connect, entertain, and even pay our taxes with a simple click of a button. So why are US elections, arguably the most important political event in the country, still held offline? Online would allow people to vote from anywhere, from home, from work, on the road, etc. And if we could do online voting in a secure way, it would be far more convenient and we wouldn't have to worry about whether the Postal Service is going to be able to reliably deliver. Especially right now when we're dealing with the COVID pandemic, uh, it might be appealing to a lot of people because they don't want to have to enter a crowded polling place. They may not even want to have to walk out to their mailbox. It would make, theoretically make it simpler for people. The concept of voting online isn't anything new. A dozen countries, including Australia, Canada, and France, have experimented with the format. And Estonia has held elections online since as early as 2005. So why doesn't the United States hold federal elections online? And will we be able to see it in the near future? While the idea of an online election seems appealing, some experts remain skeptical as to whether the U.S. is truly ready for one. Ideally, you click buttons on your screen and you're done. It sounds so seductive. The problem is we just don't know how to do it in a secure way. Cybersecurity still remains a big issue. Voting online could mean that hackers, including foreign adversaries, could interfere or manipulate the election to their advantage. The problem is that we know that foreign nation state adversaries, countries like Russia or China or others, are trying to tamper with our elections. And those countries have significant skills at cybersecurity at breaking into your phone or breaking into your computer and tampering with it. Online elections pose a challenging security concern for several reasons. There are many ways that an attacker could try to tamper with an online election. They could try to delete votes. They could try to change votes. They could try to delete voters. So you try to vote and it says, I've never heard of you. They could tamper with voter devices. They could tamper with the servers. They could tamper with the tabulation and reporting. All of it's online and all of it is potentially subject to tampering by attackers. Even if the voting infrastructure is secured, with almost 10 billion malware attacks reported in just 2019 alone, there's no guarantee that voters are voting on devices that haven't already been compromised. It's one thing to say that we need to secure our online cloud infrastructure. It's a completely other game to say that we have to also secure every single voter's home computer or home phone. Experts also warn about the potential socioeconomic divide that online elections can instigate among its voters. There's first of all people who might not have access to the internet at all or might not have um, uh, laptops or iPhones to vote on. That, that They might be at a disadvantage. Uh, but then older technology in general um, tends to be less secure. It's using software uh, that may no longer be updated. And in those cases, you are, get, you are behind on security features, behind on security updates. And it's not an exaggeration to say people with more money tend to have newer phones and newer computers. So which means that there's a socioeconomic dimension to this as well. People with more money are going to have better security practices. People with less money are forced to compromise. It's also important to note that the U.S. has already voted online in the past. 32 states and the District of Columbia offer some sort of internet voting, whether it be through the fax, email, or an online portal. In many cases, state departments collaborate with private election technology companies to run a more advanced online election. However, several audits of these elections have revealed many security vulnerabilities. In February, MIT reported finding severe security flaws in the online election system from votes the company that ran West Virginia's first mobile election that allows the hacker to alter, stop, or expose a user's vote. Another study from MIT and the University of Michigan also revealed security concerns in OmniBallot, a different system used by Delaware for their online voting options. To these allegations, votes responded that 100% of the known attempts to tamper with the live election system have been thwarted successfully. An OmniBallot commented that sending a ballot hosted and secured in a federally approved cloud environment 
is more secure than using fax machines or email attachments. The cybersecurity concerns have led the Election Assistance Commission, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, the FBI, and the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency to issue guidance in May 2020. Warning of the serious security risks that could be involved with conducting an election over the internet. We collectively, the computer security community, have been looking at online voting systems for decades, and it's considered an open problem. Even though there are companies that sell products in this space, absolutely no computer security expert will tell you that they're secure because we simply don't know how to build secure online voting yet. Besides the cybersecurity concerns, the anonymous nature of the election also pose a unique challenge. The thing that makes voting different from online banking or almost any other online activity is the requirement for anonymity. In every modern election, it's a requirement that the voter cannot prove to anybody else who they voted for. And that anonymity, which we must have for every election, is exactly the thing that makes it harder to protect the election against attacks. Because once it's out of the voter's hands, the voter cannot retain evidence that would allow them to reconstruct who they voted for. Even if a problem were to be detected, the lack of a hard paper copy would make it nearly impossible to audit a mistake. So when you have an election that has a paper ballot, you can still compare the paper ballots to the electronic copies and make sure that they match up. There are auditing techniques that can do this very efficiently to make sure you have the correct outcome of your election. When we're talking about a completely online system, there is no paper ballot. And that means that if something went wrong with, with your electronic ballots, there's no ground truth. There are no paper ballots to compare them to. And because of that, even if you could detect a problem, you'd have no way to recover from it. However, there are several unique benefits that come with holding an election online. The most obvious benefit is convenience. The big challenge that I really see in the US is that we still require fundamentally the voter to go to a particular location. And I think that's very much at odds with how citizens today lead their lives. Online elections such as the one used in Estonia are as easy as opening a computer or a phone and marking your decisions. They can do this on either their mobile phone or their tablet or their laptop. They're presented with an electronic ballot that shows the candidates that, are, that they're eligible to vote for in the particular jurisdiction that they're in. The voter is able to navigate through the ballot, look at the, look at the candidates, mark their selections, Convenience is an undeniably important factor in voting. The United States suffers from one of the lowest voter turnouts among developed countries, with just slightly more than half of the voting age population casting their ballots in 2016. Nearly 40% of the registered voters at the time blamed inaccessibility and inconvenience as the main reason for not casting a ballot. So I think this is why there is a discussion about remote voting and in particular online voting. Um, as a mechanism to potentially bring the ballot to the voter and make things easier and more convenient for the voter. If done correctly, online elections can also reduce the number of spoiled ballots and errors that threaten our election. Like the hanging chat debacle during the 2000 presidential election. If you have an electronic interface that helps people avoid the mistakes that you can make in marking a ballot, it can actually help reduce the number of voter errors and it also eliminates the need for recounts. Experts who support online elections also suggest that it could make elections more secure compared to in-person voting. If you compare, for example, online voting with the existing form of remote voting that occurs in the US, which is mail-in voting, using techniques such as strong encryption of the ballot, digital signing of the ballot, end-to-end -end verifiable processes, that allows us to actually increase security compared to, for example, mail-in voting. So can it be more secure? Yes. Can it be more transparent? Yes. Can it be more accessible? Yes. It, it, it's an overwhelming yes, there's no question. Despite the arguments surrounding its validity and accuracy, 
Online voting can bring a much needed innovation to our election system today. Should we be innovating in election technology and perhaps even moving one day to a system where we have uh, online voting? Yeah, we should be looking to that, but we should only be doing it um, with our eyes wide open um, and with very clear security targets for doing so. We, we just have we don't have those standards at all right now in the United States. Private companies like Smartmatic have worked to improve its online voting hardware and software. Its election technology has been used in countries like Belgium, Argentina, and the Philippines. And Utah also used this software during the presidential caucus in 2016. People conflate the fear of, of state-sponsored uh, intervention in U.S. elections with online voting. And, and the reality is that, you know, a well-designed online voting system is built in such a way to protect against uh, intrusion by external uh, malicious actors and also internal malicious actors. While cybersecurity concerns are entirely valid, those in favor of online elections believe it's an ongoing battle that can be won. There are new threat vectors that come into play each day. So we don't rest on our laurels. Um, we know that even if we've built a solution that, that's capable of, of defending against those vulnerabilities today, then tomorrow the situation might be different. So we're continually innovating we're continually developing, we're continually researching. New innovations in technology have also figured out ways that can allow voters to safely vote on devices that have already been compromised. What we've designed actually in our system is one that assumes that maybe your device has been compromised. So you have to be able to verify that your vote was cast correctly using this um, second channel verification, which proves that your vote was not compromised. And in the unlikely situation that your vote was compromised by malware, and it's worth mentioning that in all the elections we've run, that has never happened, right? You have the ability to take remedial action. With the concerns surrounding audits, online election could not only reduce error to prevent recounts, but also provide its own unique method of auditing to look for errors in the system rather than the votes themselves. When you're running the compiled code on servers, you can have technologies and services that are running that, that actually prove that no, um, that, that no kind of malicious versions of the code are running and no malware is injected, and you can provide all of the logs as part of an audit process there. However, regarding whether the US is ready to vote online in the near future, even the most optimistic remains skeptical. Unfortunately, I don't believe it is because um, I think there are um, there's a massive educational process that needs to take place um, to, to get people to understand, you know, what an online voting system should have, what it should do. Right now, online elections are an academic research project. It's really, you know, maybe in a decade we'll know how to do it. The policymakers and the legislators need to, um, if you like, lean in and work with providers such as Smartmatic and understand um, how you can build a system successfully and also talk to other governments around the world that, has, that have done this successfully.